Thank you to the uh, Center and the Mengesh Hemisphere Project for the opportunity to discuss this, the implications for U.S. national security of the uh, new policy towards Cuba. Following the December 17th announcement by President Obama of a new policy towards Cuba, the administration and those supporting the policy change have thought to outline what they believe are the goals of, of this policy. And basically, they have come up with three so-called uh, cornerstones of the policy. They want to foster the small private sector in Cuba. They want to promote or encourage U.S. foreign direct investment. And the policy also pursues to promote American tourism. According to the logic that the administration is pursuing, these uh, changes will help to bring about a change towards democratic governance in Cuba and thus improve U.S. security interest in the area. The problem is that these three premises are demonstrably false. So let me just begin by peeling the onion a little bit regarding the objectives that we are pursuing. When the administration talks about fostering the small private sector, the underlying logic is that a private sector in Cuba, and by the way, that is a misnomer, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, would come for a certain amount of independence to these self-employed individuals. They no longer have to depend upon the government for their income, and that, uh, independence will at some point make them agents of change and thus they could promote democratic governance at one point. Sounds logical. However, again, it is demonstrably true. We can look at two very specific examples. When the students in China came out in Tiananmen Square in protest and to promote democratic values, the entrepreneurial sector at that time in China simply did not support the students. They did not come out in support of the students. We saw a very similar situation recently in Hong Kong when the students came out in support of democracy and the uh, entrepreneurial sector failed to support the students. Why is that? Well, what it happens is that instead of conferring greater independence on this self-employed sector, this sector actually becomes more dependent upon the government for the permits to operate, for their livelihood. Maybe this is the first time in the case of Cuba that these self-employed individuals are beginning to make some money and they are not going to antagonize the government by coming out in support of democracy. So the, 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 the concept that they become independent is demonstrably false, they actually become much more dependent upon the government, and now they have something to lose, so they're not going to risk it. Um, we can also look at Cuba's, Cuba's history for, for instruction. Uh, just before Fidel Castro launched in 1968, his um, massive confiscation of, of, of uh, private sector activity in Cuba, there were over 55,000 private sector uh, enterprises in Cuba. That, and, and at that time, these were individuals that were familiar with Republican Cuba and had an idea of democratic values and the like. And then again, that very massive private sector did not prevent the Castro regime from, from going forward. So to argue that is strengthening these individuals that simply receive permission from the Cuban government. This is not a private sector with uh, a sole proprietorship or a corporation as we understand those terms. These are people who have been given permission to function in precisely 201 activities, all menial activities, all within the domestic sector, repairing umbrellas, refilling cigarette lighters, uh, shining shoes, cutting hair. Those are the so-called private sector. In fact, I would argue, and I think we're seeing this in Cuba right now, that as that sector gains strength, uh, 
increased repression is what we are going to see in Cuba, and we are actually seeing that not right now because increased repression is going to be necessary. The second leg of this argument is to sort of promote or encourage U.S. foreign direct investment in Cuba. And let me begin by correcting the preposition. When we talk about investing in Cuba, I have no idea what that means. It's investing with Cuba. Let's, let's be very clear about this. We're not talking about investing in Cuba in a neutral sense. By definition, it means investing with Cuba in partnership with the Cuban government, and to be more specific, in partnership with the Cuban military. So we are actually promoting investing in partnership with the Cuban military. And by the way, it would have to be a minority ownership. Cuba was, does not allow majority ownership. So American companies in, in this companies in this case would have to accept being minority partners with the Cuban government, the Cuban military. Under very onerous conditions, in a situation where there is no independent judiciary to adjudicate any claims. And just to give you one example of how offensive this is. Investors in Cuba cannot hire their own employees. You're not allowed to hire your employees. You have to request the employees that you need from the Cuban government. If you have a restaurant and you need a chef or a waiter, you have to request it from a Cuban agency. The Cuban government will then find you the employees, supposedly, and provide you with that employee. The investor has to pay the Cuban government agency in convertible currency. That agency, in turn, pays the employee in Cuban pesos, retaining about 92% of the employee's earnings. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you call that. I call it slavery. It is a form of slavery, and it violates all sorts of international labor organization rules. So we are promoting that kind of investment in, in Cuba. Uh, and the third leg is American tourism. Well, uh, apparently, according to uh, administration officials, uh, Americans can be ambassadors of democratic values and democratic governance will result as a result of, will come about as a result of additional travel by, by American tourists. Well, to begin with, Cuba has been receiving over two million visitors per year from practically every other country in the world. Europe, Asia, uh, Latin America, Canada, Certainly, these tours have not had any impact whatsoever in uh, bringing about democratic change in Cuba. So why do we believe that the American tours are going to be different? That is a very ethnocentric, kind of patronizing type of approach to think that a handful of American tourists are going to be successful where the Canadians and the Germans and the French and the Italians have certainly not been able to, to, to do so. Frankly, I think the American tourists, like any other tourist, if you work very hard all year and you have a couple of weeks vacation, you're going to spend it in Varadero, you're going to be drinking some mojitos, and you're not going to get involved in, in, in the public. That's not what you do on vacation. Um, an American tourist that may arrive in a cruise ship is going to disembark, buy some cigars, a bottle of rum, and maybe in four hours be back in the ship. How is that going to promote democratic governance? Um, again, it, it just does not make sense to think along, along those lines. I'd like to highlight that it's been nearly 40 years since China introduced quite profound economic reforms. Vietnam followed 37, some, some years after that. Today, those countries are certainly wealthier. That is a function of capitalism. But they have not moved one bit towards democratic governance. So the thesis that this diplomatic engagement and uh, economic engagement somehow leads inexorably uh, 
to democratic reforms is, as I, as I mentioned, demonstrably false. Now, what does that mean in terms of U.S. national security? Uh, last year, when the uh, New York Times and a, a few other publications sort of started a, a rather aggressive campaign to promote change in U.S. Cuba policy, I wrote a, uh, a paper called WWCD, What Would Castro Do? And my argument was everybody's asking the United States to unilaterally and unconditionally change its U.S. policy, but we're not asking what would Castro do? Frankly, when we talk about foreign policy, I think we, we normally use the analogy of a chess game, where if I make this move, I expect my adversary to make this other move, and so on and so forth. But no one seemed to have asked what would Castro do. It, it, was, it was a totally independent type of, of thing. Well, we now know. Uh, General Raul Castro, shortly after the announcement, uh, speaking in Costa Rica to a Latin American audience, basically did what any good negotiator would do. He pocketed the concessions and said, but now I need the following. So Raul Castro pocketed our unconditional concessions. I said, yes, thank you very much, but you know what? I now need for you to return the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo. I need for you to stop the transmissions of radio and TV Marti. I need you to compensate Cuba to the tune, I think it's up to like $1 trillion for the supposed damages of the embargo. Um, I need to take Cuba off the list of nations that sponsor terrorism, and so on and so forth. So he made additional demands. Apparently, we have begun going down that path because Cuba has indeed been removed from the list of states that sponsor terrorism. The budget of Radio and TV MRT has been curtailed in a number of ways. And we are beginning to hear arguments, and this scares the hell out of me. We're beginning to hear arguments that, well, you know, the U.S. naval base in Guantanamo is a relic of the Cold War. It's too expensive. It's no longer necessary. When one begins to hear those arguments, watch out. We're also beginning to hear that maybe Cuba is indeed owed some compensations. And certainly we're moving, or the president has argued, for the uh, immediate removal of economic sanctions. Just, just a couple of points regarding the implications for this. Imagine, for example, if we continue to promote uh, U.S. travel, and, and tourism, at some point, I, I would imagine, uh, Americans would be able to travel by, by vessel to Cuba, and, and uh, we may see, and, and Cuban Americans as well, perhaps thousands of small boats traveling between South Florida and Cuba every single month. I guarantee that some of those boats will be returning to South Florida with contraband of some sort, human contraband, drugs, products, or the like. How are we going to monitor that? The Coast Guard is totally unable to, to monitor. It would be thousands of vessels traveling to and from South Florida and Cuba. The danger, and we all certainly realize how close Cuba is to Iran, for example, the danger of terrorists using that border that we're now creating another border security to uh, infiltrate terrorists into the United States, I think it is tremendously great. Also, since the 1990s, American policy towards Latin America had been fairly consistent in uh, protection of democratic governance and democratic values. To be fair, not in the rest of the world, but in Latin America, we had been consistent. The message was, we want to encourage democratic governance. Well, we have now changed that message. And the message that we have sent to Latin America and to the rest of the world is that democratic governance is no longer important to the United States. And in order to have a good economic and diplomatic relationship with the United States, we no longer need to protect human rights.
We have plenty of would-be dictators in our continent, and ladies and gentlemen, over the next few years, we're going to see tremendous issues because we have now sent the message that go right ahead is not going to impair your relationships with our country. Thank you very much.